Uh, my name's Anne Edwards, um, and I'm chair of Australia's National Research Organisation for Women's Safety, which we call Anne Rose, as you can see. Um, it's no, it is an accident, but it's a fortunate accident that Anne Rose are two women's names. Easy to remember and very appropriate. Anne Rose and the South Australian Government are co-hosting this significant public lecture here in Adelaide, and we are extremely fortunate to have the Premier here with us. Um, at the start of this event, he, will, he has a, a, a speech that he wants to give, and then unfortunately, he will have to go. Um, I would, though, before we start, like to introduce Georgina Williams, who will give us a welcome to country. So, Georgina, would you like to come up here? Um, Liz, yeah? I'm sorry I didn't read your book, but it's something that I've been actually working with that brought me home to country. Um, in this little book, when a group of women, Aboriginal women and white women, got together in the 150th year of the celebration of the occupation of the Ghana people's country. And I've always um, worked for that, and I, could, I actually saw all of the things that you're talking about in that relationship of how, um, what I see is that um, the welfare of the people depends on what kind of income they have to be able to participate in the mainstream society. And if they don't, then they turn inside on themselves and internalise that oppression. And that's what I've seen for us Aboriginal people, always living out on the fringes of everything all of the time. And so when we put this little booklet together in 1986, and it was published the year of the celebration of the 150th year, and the Jibruki journey opened. That uh, I was instrumental, well, I actually forcefully created that, you know, worked with people to draw back up out of the country that lie, and I'm still working on it, and that is those last natural places, can they please be left? because to take them away is to take away our relationship to who we are. That is the mirror of ourselves to look into. So, in my angry days, I wrote this poem about wailing spirit. And for you, the British, <laughs> sorry, um, who created these things for us, um, but mind you, I'm half British myself. That's another thing I have to get onto if I can ever get the time. Because I'm my father and my grandparents, great-grandparents, they married each other, so I was always British, actually. So I was incarcerated into mission life when I was a British subject all of that time, my family. So I'm still on to that. That's something that I've got to, if I can have the time. Sunday was my 75th birthday, so I don't know how much time I've got to be able to do these things, but there is the British side of me, the blue eyes, the, color, the coffee colour. So I'm also, the same as everyone else here that comes from somewhere else, half of me anyway, okay? So, but I was never ever able to become that half until even now. So this is what I wrote about that then, bringing back the spirit of our people. So this is what's going on in our country today and it's hard yakka, working through how we'll do this thing called reconciliation because reconciliation is something that you were together and then you parted and then you're making up. Conciliation is what we probably need to first before to say, you know, conciliate the problem between one another because we were interactive and never shared nothing. And that's the real truth of it. And so I stick there. And I just came from the breakfast this morning and nobody said anything about anything that I'm saying now. So I hope I don't take too long, but I'd like to actually, because I'm a poet that can't actually write poetry because I'm looking after little children still, um, my little granny kids, the great granny girl that um, has to be um, going to school and having problems about settling down, and I'm gonna have problems with that because they wanna send her home. And I say, no, she has to learn your structure of life and that is the structure of what she has to do. Can't accommodate the other, she can't come home because it's only me home. Sorry, she has to, you have to find something in the school to work out that problem. So always, I'm always put in a situation where I have to speak up about something because 
of what's happening. And what happened here in the past is still with us in the present. And in this poem, I speak about that past. And this poem is about the death and destruction of our people. And it's called The Wailing Spirit. Weep, my spirit, tales untold. White man got a stranglehold. Used our women in days of old. Black bodies in the dust. Undeserving of their lust. Serving only rape at first, never quenched that white man's thirst. The land, the land, and f that little band. The coons will never know what they're doing in this show. Coffee-coloured politicos, separated from the rest. Manipulation at its best. I'll take the credit for the rest. <laughs> Laughs in scorn at that poor spirit. All shattered and forlorn. Never more to be reborn. High my spirit soars, seeking, searching for the spores. Listen, black fellow to the wind, the mother again, her wailing to begin. My country was this my place. Where are my children? Lost in space. So. Thank you for that, my angry self. This is me coming home, and that's what it's called. And it's dedicated to a little girl called Canado. And at the time she was given that name, she was the firstborn. And because our language wasn't back to us, and there's issues with that, by the way, but um, she was given this name of my great-great-grandmother. And um, she's a doctor now, a medical doctor and one of our future people, and it's wonderful to have that. And as I said, I put the old things into these forms, the old songs from our past, because they were always the things that guided us in our communications, in our relationships to people, to country, to the animals, to the grass, to the plants, to the sea, the sky, the rain, the wind, everything that makes us human because without those things, we fast lose our humanity and we become violent. And the violence you speak of is what happens when we're trapped only in the city. And so I still work for what's outside and what we need open space for, because the more we, the more we do not have the relationship to open space, our little people and our school people and our middle, younger people having parklands and so on that have in, uh, cultural, uh, spiritual enrichment that belongs to our old ways, still available to us, then it will cause these things that cause domestic violence. Because you need to have that. It's part of your need of yourself as a human being to advance your spiritual growth inside yourself. So this is what I wrote about me when I was broken down and coming home. And that's what it's called. Coming home. I am an old spirit born to this new world, taken from my place to die, stripped and beaten. My land you claimed you and call your own, old spirit, red earth. Narangana is my name, yes. I am an old spirit, spawned today in this new form. Before I was here, I slept in peace, buried deep a seed inside my mother's girth. Old spirit, red earth, ravaged and torn, weary and worn, she labored in my birth. Then to her bosom I was drawn, tenderly she suckled me. Old spirit, red earth, now I feel the pain, Fear, anxious, upon my face appear. What was I born for? What must I die for? I labour on where time stands still, yet always I am born anew, old spirit, red earth. Silent in the night, my father gave his seed to lie in wait to germinate, old spirit, red earth. Out of the dust of these old bones I rise, my silence shattered by the glaring neon light. 
In full circle, I bear this child anew. Narangana is her name. Thank you for that. So I have, I am warring with the British still about, I might, may need to adopt my British identity to say, you know, to the Australian people that I have uh, been deprived of my rights as a British subject for generations of time to now and beyond now. So all of that which has been accumulated by everyone else over the six or four, seven generation we're into now, I have been denied access to as a British subject. That's something that we haven't even thought of yet, is it? <laughs> but anyway, I'm, thank you for uh, inviting me and it's Good to be here. I actually worked in the, in the area of domestic violence and severe traumatised uh, people and I developed the first outreach in Canberra with the Rape Crisis Centre because I worked there as a trauma counsellor for three years of my life and developed that and took people out of the building rather than contained within just a small room and went and communicated with people. And that system, outreach, is still operating in New South Wales successfully and so it's still there so now I should do what I'm here to do which is to greet you and meet you and welcome you to my country yungana yakana ngankini miena nai nari karanya yambu ngangki boka migawi nai mani na budni tawala manaincha tanda yungana dalya yakana dalya thank you for coming and I meet and greet you with my arms outstretched because you're a woman like myself who sees things beyond what is in the now. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Georgina. I can't imagine um, a more uh, meaningful way to start the discussion that we're having today. Uh, but I'm very mindful of the importance of the activities that we're engaged in uh, in this research centre being extremely conscious and sensitive about the particular issues of violence against women and their children and family violence generally in Aboriginal communities. So thank you very much indeed. Um, and I would also like to pay my respects to the traditional owners, the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains and my respects to the Ghana elders past, present and future. Now I'd like to formally welcome uh, our Premier, the Honourable Jay Wetherill, who will speak to you shortly. Um, also the Honourable Gail Gago, Minister for the Status of Women in South Australia. Rachel Sanderson, the Shadow Minister for Families and Child Protection. We have a range of representatives here I know from government and departments and from um, service providers and other agencies who are involved in this work and interested to hear what we might be going to listen to from Professor Kelly today. Um, I'd like to formally welcome Heather Nan Caro, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Anne Rose. Anne Rose is based in Sydney, so she's travelled down today. We also, I hope, have some researchers, um, and then we have obviously members of the public. Finally, um, I would like to formally welcome, obviously, our guest lecturer, Professor Liz Kelly from the London Metropolitan University. Um, Professor Kelly, Heather and I have just spent much of this week in Sydney at the inaugural Asia Pacific Conference on Gendered Violence and Violations, with close to 400 participants from many countries and many organisations looking at these issues as they are experienced and the challenges they pose in countries in the Asia-Pacific region as well as in Australia. So I would like to start though briefly by telling you a little about Anne Rose um, before introducing the Premier who will speak to you before we move on to the uh, formal business of today which is the public lecture from Professor Kelly. Now Anne Rose is a key component of the Austra Australia's 12-year national plan to reduce violence against women and their children, which was adopted by the Commonwealth and all state and territory governments in 2011, and jointly funded by all those governments. And it runs at least for 12 years. 
This plan is a very important initiative as it recognised for the first time that Australia needs to tackle this very serious and individually and socially damaging problem of domestic family and sexual violence with a coordinated national approach. And it clearly links these forms of violence to gender inequality, power relationships, and particular cultural beliefs and attitudes about the differences between men and women and their behavior and roles, which are the sources of these problems. The plan aims to reduce this violence by tackling the sources through prevention strategies, working also with Our Watch and White Ribbon, as, and at the same time, to focus on assisting and supporting those who have experienced or are at risk of experiencing such violence. Since 2011, in Australia, we've had a number of highly publicised, appalling incidents where women and or their children have died at the hands of current or ex-male partners. And there has been a growing level of public concern and pressure from the community as a whole for more investment in and more coordination of the services that are, need to be provided. So ANROSE was established in 2013 with the responsibility to organize the, and fund research that will increase understanding of violence against women and their children, its causes and consequences, and provide evidence about what strategies, policies, programs and services are the most effective in reducing that violence. In 2014, ANROSE in consultation with our funders, the service providers, uh, sector, practitioners and research community produced first a three to five year comprehensive national research agenda in this area. And then we produced uh, the first round of our research programs funding to 20 priority projects to the total value of 3.5 million. And later this year, we will announce a further round of projects which are targeted specifically at male perpetrator programs and interventions and looking at ways in which we can evaluate their effectiveness. Close to 100 researchers to date from all states and territories have become involved in our research work in various capacities and they cover the researchers who have received funding are working on a range of topics which will deliver findings that are applicable to the whole country, not to any particular single state. Now, South Australia, because we are in South Australia, is a very strong supporter of the national plan and of the work of ANROSE. South Australian government has developed its own strategy for women's, women's safety, and the Premier, um, Jay Weatherall, is now going to speak to you briefly about his government's commitment to making domestic and family violence initiatives a priority in this state. So please can I introduce the Honourable Jay Weatherall. Well, thank you, uh, Professor Edwards, um, and thank you in particular to Georgina for that uh, beautiful welcome to country. Um, it was uh, wise, um, um, very articulate, and, uh, and the poems were beautiful. So thank you very much for, for that lovely welcome to country. I uh, can also acknowledge my ministerial colleague, um, also um, my parliamentary colleagues, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Well, it's great to be here to open this lecture, and I thank the opportunity for ANROSE, and it's my great pleasure to welcome the Professor, Professor Liz Kelly, here to South Australia. I want to reflect a little bit on um, a political life, because it often can be a story of dealing with daily distractions. Uh, and uh, the most common question people ask me is, why on earth do you do it? Um, so why did I choose a political life? Well, I first became involved in politics because I wanted to fight injustice. I thought that um, I could do that as a lawyer, and that was great. You could help one person at a time. But as a politician, if you got things right, you could help many people by making policies. But I've actually come to realise that the really great changes are made through the power of ideas. And in her groundbreaking work, Survival, Surviving Sexual Violence, 
Professor Kelly established a profound new idea, the concept of the continuum of violence. And it changed the way that many people think about sexual violence and looked at the connection between violence in its many different forms and their connection to structural gender inequality. Some still pretend that gender inequality doesn't exist. Our society is guilty of turning a blind eye or understating its pervasive, harmful and denigrating effect. Gender inequality grows from an unequal power relationship between men and women, which has many harmful manifestations. Violence against women is the physical expression of unequal power relationships. As a father of two young girls, the high incidence of violence against women horrifies me. A society uh, should not be proud of the statistics that we see. On that score, uh, those most vulnerable to the threat of physical harm in our community, women and children, the story is an appalling one. One in six Australian women have experienced physical or sexual violence at the hands of their current or former partner. One woman is killed by their current or former partner almost every week, although I noticed this year we're running ahead of that awful statistic. When children are involved, they're also at risk. Even when they're not physically harmed, the mental scars endured. And because of what we know about the caring responsibilities that many women have, they can't keep themselves safe. They can't keep their children safe and protected. We talk a lot in politics about what we need to do to improve our economic performance. But if asked to describe the dreams that I have for my two beautiful young girls, I dream of them finding secure work that they'll enjoy doing, enter relationships that fulfil themselves, and for them to be the very best that they can be. But my greatest desire for them is that they live in a world free of violence or fear. I pledged last year that the issue of violence against women would be a priority for me as Premier for as long as I'm in this role. And I'm proud to say this week in the Governor's speech where we've laid out the platform for our state government over the next three years, we have put this front and centre. If I can contribute modestly to the change of attitudes to women, I will have considered my time in politics worthwhile. But to do so, we must consider the source of the problem. Why does our society fail to protect those most vulnerable to the threat of physical harm? And why does the greatest threat reside within our homes? We can't address the issue of domestic violence without addressing how women are perceived by men in our society. A clear understanding of the role of men in a fair and decent society is needed if we're to address this issue. When a man subconsciously believes that a physical relationship uh, confers ownership and a broken relationship justifies violence, we have a problem. So what are we going to do about it? The attitudes that bequeath violence must be addressed as surely as the acts of violence must be condemned. We must cultivate a sense of freedom that transcends genders. Both men and women can decide when and how they enter relationships and when and how they leave them. We must consistently condemn the attitude that a relationship confers ownership. And we also must reinforce the notion that people can recall choices that they make at any moment. But I think that the men in our society have a particular responsibility to reflect on this, our sense of what it means to be a man in modern society. I want to shine a light on the role men play in re reducing the prevalence of domestic violence. Decent men must publicly speak up against domestic violence and actively support campaigns to address it. Men have to speak out when others treat women disrespectfully or talk about them in a disrespectful manner. Our words often precede and inform our actions. Men must demonstrate to other men that it's not necessary to control or dominate all that's around them to be a man in this world. The effects of cultural change may not be seen for years. And our women and children are under threat now. So when I made domestic violence a priority for our government, I understood the stronger policies were needed to protect women under immediate threat. But we also need to rely upon organisations like ANROSE to help to carry this conversation to the broader issue. 
ANROSE, the National Research Organisation for Women's Safety, is the first of its kind in Australia. Its work is invaluable to the work of our government, and that's why I'm so pleased to be here to support it. Um, I'm so pleased to be able to welcome you here today. Um, thank you so much for giving us this opportunity to understand this most important issue more deeply so that we can act. Thank you. Thank you very much, Premier. Um, and uh, of course, that does mean that we're going to keep an eye on what's happening in South Australia. <laughs> So I would now like to invite um, the Chief Executive Officer of ANROS, Heather Nancaro, who has previously worked in Queensland, is now based in Sydney, and is, today is in Adelaide, and she's going to introduce Professor Kelly. Heather. Thank you very much, Anne. Ani Georgina, thank you so much for the very warm welcome to Adelaide uh, and to the country of the Guana people. And thank you especially for sharing so much of your personal story. Um, I found your poems incredibly moving and um, uh, really deeply moving. And, and um, you know, I just admire your strength and courage to be able to share that with us and, and most sincerely thank you for it. I'd like to um, begin um, following acknowledgement of country, of Guana people, uh, by acknowledging our special guests here. And I'd, I'd like to pay a particular tribute to my friend and colleague, Vanessa Swan, who was uh, a member of the National Council to reduce violence against women and their children that led to the development of the, the national plan. So Adelaide has uh, played uh, and continues to play a very important um, part in uh, the work that ANROSE does on uh, reduction of violence against women and their children. So this is one of the, the events uh, that ANROSE has uh, convened under its, uh, one of its three core functions of uh, knowledge production, knowledge translation exchange and leadership. This is clearly one of the events, one of the functions or activities conducted under our knowledge translation and exchange function. We see ANROSE and the work that we do as vital to work on violence, reduction of violence against women uh, and their children across the whole country. And whilst we're in Adelaide today, we do intend to be in every uh, country, every state, sorry, in every part of uh, the country um, on working on various events um, uh, and bringing people like uh, Professor Liz Kelly uh, to co communities uh, working on this very difficult um, perplexing issue of violence against women. Today's public lecture follows an ANROSE workshop on key practice issues for sexual assault workers that Professor Kelly conducted in Sydney on Monday. It was attended by practitioners, policy makers and researchers from every state and territory of Australia. Recognising that violence against women is an extremely important public issue and ending it is a responsibility shared by governments, civil society and the general public we have invited Professor Kelly to deliver this public lecture here in Adelaide. It will be recorded and made available on the ENROSE website for other Australians who could not be here with us in Adelaide. It now gives me great pleasure to formally introduce Professor Liz Kelly, CBE, to deliver this public lecture. Professor Kelly is co-chair of the End Violence Against Women Coalition UK, EVOR, and Professor of Sexualised Violence at London Metropolitan University, where she is also the Director of Child and Woman Abuse Studies Unit. In 1987, she established the concept of the continuum of violence in her highly acclaimed book, Surviving Sexual Violence. In 2000, Professor Kelly was awarded a CBE in the New Year's Honours List for services combating violence against women and children. Most recently, Professor Kelly led Project Mirabal and, uh, with Professors Nicole Westmarland and Charlotte Watts. Project Mirabal investigates the effectiveness of perpetrator programs in reducing violence and increasing safety for women and children and the way programs contribute to coordinated community responses to domestic violence. And as you heard Anne say earlier, Anne Rose uh, later this year will be announcing a second part of our research program focused on the work uh, of uh, across Australia on uh, working with perpetrators of, of um, domestic family and sexual violence. And again, Liz's work will be uh, incredibly important as we move forward in that um, program of research. 
So please join me in a very warm welcome to Professor Liz Kelly as she revisits the continuum of violence in the 21st century. Thank you, Heather. Um, thank you, Anne Rose. Thank you, Government of South Australia. And thank you, Georgina, for your welcome to country, but also for the gift that you gave me, um, both the gift of a book, but also the gift of your time and your thoughts and your challenge to me as someone who comes from Britain. We have much to um, atone for, and we have yet to do it. Um, I want to acknowledge the um, custodians of the land, the Guana people and the elders, past, present and future. So, this is a process that I have been going through over the last five years to think back to this concept that was at the heart of my PhD, um, the continuum of sexual violence. The, um, the, the, the book, my PhD became a book. Um, this book, amazingly, is still in print um, 27 years later. And I keep encountering survivors who tell me that the, the book is important to them. And I don't think it's because of my ideas particularly, a little bit maybe, but because the book is full of the words of other survivors, full of women's words about what violence was um, and how they dealt with it and how it continues to resonate in their lives. So I think it's those other women's voices that are what matters still. Um, in 2010, this book was published and every one of the chapters is supposed to take um, the continuum concept as the point that it begins from. And reading those chapters and also some of the ways um, PhD students have interpreted the idea of the continuum um, makes clear that I have to begin at the beginning um, and talk about what it, what it meant and why it was significant um, for me at the time. It's hard now to remember how little we knew about violence against women as researchers. Women have always known about it, communities have always known about it, but as researchers, as academics, we knew very, very little. Um, there were hardly any frameworks to think about it through. And it was actually considered rare that it was committed by a very few um, deviant, crazy men or in the odd dysfunctional families. It was not at the heart of all our communities. So what we knew, what I knew as a feminist, didn't come from research. It came from the consciousness raising groups in which we shared our own experiences and the services that we established, the refuges, the shelters, and the red crisis centers. And that's where I first heard women talking about their lives and their stories of abuse. And what they said didn't fit with what I saw and read um, in, when I was a, a student doing my first degree. And so I started to think in terms of connections, that the things that women were talking about were not separate. There was something that connected them. My interest was actually really twofold. And, and this, is, this is the origins of, of this piece of work. The first is my own encounters as a young woman with what we call minor intimate intrusions. And as I listened in those consciousness raising groups to women telling similar stories, what I saw was that we changed our behavior because of these so-called unimportant things. And then the second was a Finnish au pair. Her name was Annelie. And she sought out the refuge, the shelter in which I was a volunteer, as a place to be on her day off. She was the first woman who ever talked to me about having been sexually abused by her father repeatedly. And she made connections between that experience 
and the domestic violence that the women in the refuge were fleeing from. So my everyday experiences brought to the fore the question of who decides what's abusive? Who decides what counts? And Annalise brought up the issue of what connects the violations that take place in different relationships, in different contexts, in different points in your life course. And what the concept of the continuum did was allow me to explore both those things. Um, I built on the work of others. We're never entirely original. Um, so Judith Herman had already defined incest at that point as an exaggeration of patriarchal family norms, not a departure from them. And Joseph Marola and Diana Scully said that rape was the end point of a socially sanctioned continuum of male sexual aggression. In the original formulation of the continuum, um, I used two definitions from the dictionary. Um, two definitions of what continuum means. The first one is a basic common character that connects, underlies different events. So the many forms of intrusion, coercion, and assault are connected. And this is the meaning that's been used most commonly since. The second dictionary definition, though, is a continuous series of elements and events that pass into one another and cannot be readily distinguished. That the categories that we use to name and distinguish forms of violence, whether in research, law or policy, shade into and out of one another. And this meaning has been less understood and or used, possibly because it challenges some fairly fundamental ways of making sense of the world. And it remains a challenge. It remains a challenge at the level of women's experience, that women locate their own experiences in different points on the continuum, but also for us in research, policy, and practice. Some people have said that actually, actually I asked women to locate their experiences on this continuum. That's not what happened. I asked them about all the things that had happened to them um, in, in their childhood, adulthood, and in their various relationship contexts. It was working with their transcripts, doing analytic work with their transcripts that I came up with the idea to reflect their experiences. And I was doing what Canadian feminist Dorothy Smith says our approach to experience should be. So lived lives are our starting point but it's the responsibility of a researcher to theorize in and through those lives. The clearest example of this within surviving sexual violence was the way in which women named unwanted sex. Many of them were unwilling to use the concept of rape. This was a qualitative study. I wanted to honor how women made sense of their own experiences. So I had an obligation to represent this somehow, but it, it, it was not enough to say that these were, this was not consensual sex, but they didn't want to call it rape. So I started to use these concepts of um, pressurized and coercive sex to show that this was not wanted, it was not consensual, but for those women, it didn't yet in their minds constitute rape. And I think this issue troubles us still in research and in life. In prevalence research, there's been a huge debate, it still goes on in the US, um, between Mary Koss and a number of um, male academics about whether incidents that fit a legal definition of rape, but which the participants in the research don't themselves call rape, should they be counted as rape? For me, the continuum allows us to think at an experiential level and to see that there are no clear-cut lines for women between consensual sex and rape. And that they locate their own experiences 
at different points in time in different places. That issue of naming. But the, the frames of crime and law give much less space for that recognition. In more recent work I've done on trafficking, the meaning of the continuum has been explored in terms of the ways in which migration, smuggling and trafficking shade in and out of one another in complex ways in the lived experiences of women and men. But at the same time, they're constructed in law and policy, in national law, in international law, as mutually exclusive categories. No person agrees to be trafficked. What they agree to, what they sometimes seek, is an illicit route to migrate, to be smuggled. The exploitation that's a key part of trafficking comes later. And in some cases, it's not even evident until they go home and find out that the money that they thought was being remitted to their family never arrived. This has huge implications for identification of cases because most people are unlikely to perceive themselves as a victim, yet that de designation is increasingly necessary if they are to access protection and rights. In surviving sexual violence, I wanted to be clear that there was no implication of linearity or seriousness with the exception of violence that results in death. The only more or less was in terms of how common these things were in women's lives. Most women recalled encounters with harassment, but sexual and physical assaults were less common. And it's here that I think most has been lost in intervening years. With research, policy and practice, and Australia is a prime example here, focusing on intimate partner violence and to a lesser extent sexual assault. The everyday routine intimate intrusions that were so central to the idea of the continuum have dropped off many agendas, leading to the oft-quoted cliche that domestic violence is the most common form of violence against women. It is the most researched, it's the most counted, but when prevalent studies include a series of questions on sexual harassment, as the French and German studies did recently, we discover that this is considerably more common in women's lives. And in um, 1990, I wrote a paper with um, a feminist colleague of mine, Jill Radford. We drew on my interview data and her um, survey data to write about these everyday encounters. And we, the paper's called Nothing Really Happened because that's how women talked about these events. But actually what they were talking about, something did happen. They were harassed in some way. They were made to feel fearful. They were made to feel um, they didn't have the same right to be in public space as men did. But they would never report these events to a crime survey because they weren't crimes. And in their, their minds, nothing really happened. Let's look at some of the things that did happen. I was curb crawled, followed by somebody trying to pay for sex. I hate this sort of thing. It happened again later in the day when I was walking home. I was in tears by the time I got home. Nothing happened, just comments. I was intimidated. She's in tears, she's intimidated, she's made to feel worthless, but nothing happened. I've been frequently harassed by curb crawlers. It happened even when I was pregnant. There were several incidents about a fortnight ago, although nothing actually happened. It makes me sick and angry. I don't go out much alone now. I resent that enormously. So nothing has happened, but she is not going out alone now anymore. These women, interestingly, I don't know whether they would say this now, given the discourse on terrorism that we live with, but these women actually talk about these experiences as a form of terror, as a form of terrorization. 
that, that it's intended to intimidate. It's intended to make you feel afraid, to make you feel like you don't have the same right to be in this space. And the last one, I think, is particularly important. It's about um, the intersection between sexism and racism in the lives of many black women. And at the end, she says, he didn't do anything. It makes me really sick. So women's lives are being changed. We are adapting. We are feeling sick. We're feeling fearful. But actually, nothing happens to us. And part of what I wanted to do with the concept of the continuum was to give these experiences um, a, a significance, a reality in women's lives. And I'm very heartened at the recent resurgence of young women's activism in the UK on sexual harassment. We have organizations like Hollaback, I think there's a Hollaback in Australia, um, Everyday Sexism, using the power of connection of the internet to give women a space to write about these kinds of experiences and also their own strategies of resistance. I'm aware that virtual space is also a place where harassment and abuse can happen not a new form of violence, but an anonymous context in which men can demean, diminish, and attempt to silence women's and especially feminist voices. But resistance is also evident here too, with the creation of Facebook pages. Um, one I found recently, um, telling women to smile is sexist. One of the things that has irritated me throughout my life has been walking in public space, and the man, I'm, thinking my own thoughts, um, uh, and um, they say, cheer up, love, it might never happen. I.e., smile at me, pay attention to me, you're in my space. So this Facebook page is actually challenging that way of um, expecting women to respond to men in particular ways. The continuum within forms of violence was also important, and here one of the original interviews still stands out to me. This is a woman... His father was a lawyer. He never did anything that would constitute a crime at the time that I interviewed her. But he sexualized his relationship throughout her whole adolescence. And he required her to dance with him so that his erection pressed against her body. The consequence of that for her, including understanding as an adult how deliberately he'd orchestrated his own safety whilst making her feel in danger and afraid, were really similar to those of women who talked about experiences with repeated rape. And so that's part of why I question this idea of um, a hierarchy of seriousness. I still stand by that, but I think we know now that repeated penetrative sexual abuse as a child is particularly damaging and harmful um, for survivors. Um, there have been some critiques of the continuum, that it didn't um, deal with um, sexual exploitation in the sex industry, which I'll come to later, and forms of violence that are called harmful practices, um, female genital mutilation, forced marriage on a base violence. It didn't deal with any of those things. Um, I did it in um, the women who came from probably one of the whitest areas of um, the UK, and I was very unfamiliar with those forms of violence at the time. But there's nothing in principle to say it cannot accommodate them. And some of my colleagues are writing about the grey areas between arranged and forced marriage with respect to consent and coercion. And Hanana Siddiqui's chapter in this book, um, which is about uh, violence in the lives of minority women in the UK, asks whether actually on a base violence is a separate form of violence against women at all, since it shades into and out of child abuse, sexual violence, forced marriage, and domestic violence. So using one of the ideas of the continuum in, in there, one of my MA students has argued that when we look at the extremes of honour killings, we fail to notice the more everyday threats, assaults, and control of young Asian women. I've always thought that we could use the idea 
but I haven't ever done it yet myself, to explore women's accounts of prostitution. Those within and those that have exited define and understand similar experiences differently along the continuum of choice and coercion, agency and exploitation. And current debates on the sex industry tend to work with those concepts and contexts as binaries. And in the process, I think they do a disservice to the complexity and ambiguity in many women's accounts. And my colleague Maddy Coy has written eloquently ab about this issue. Um, I think I'm going to skip that bit. But there, I now want to come to what the challenges are that I didn't really realize at the time when I wrote this, what the implications were. Because there are um, implications around how we think about and define rape and how we count in prevalence studies. Just to talk about the definition of rape for a while, um, one prominent British feminist, Lynn Segal, um, in a critique of the concept of the continuum, where she says that it makes all men into rapists, which I have never said, but there you go. Um, she argues that we should make a distinction between the rapes by known men and those that use um, violence, violent rape. In saying that, she um, shows her ignorance about what we know about um, the additional violence that can be associated with sexual violence. Those committed by partners and ex-partners are amongst the most likely to result in additional injury, the most likely to involve a weapon. So she's reproducing this real rape stereotype that suffuses our legal systems. Much of the sound and fury during the Julia, uh, Julian Assange and Dominic Strauss-Kahn cases turned on precisely these issues. What counts as rape or sexual assault, in your case, in life and law? Does it have to be violent, in inverted commas, in order to qualify? Very few commentators on the Assange case understood that actually it was an understanding of the concept of the continuum that led to the reform of sexual offences law in Sweden. In Sweden, it's violation of women's bodily integrity rather than force that is the underlying principle. One of the implications that I only understood relatively recently is um, that um, the continuum actually was an attempt to not over-dramatize these experiences, to not locate them as always and um, immensely traumatic, but to actually say they're actually everyday things in the lives of many women. Um, to borrow a, another phrase from Dorothy Smith, it was the everyday and every nightness of violence that I wanted to talk about. I wanted to talk about mundane encounters with gendered power relations. That these are connected to the extremes that are reported in the media that form those um, high profile cases. That are, and those cases that are deemed worthy of legal regulation and media attention. And I think we've moved very far away from that interest in the fabric of women's everyday lives. Prevalence research has required the creation of a methodology to count violence in women's lives. And it requires making clear distinctions between what's excluded and included in a set of categories. In the crime victimization surveys, it's organized around documenting incidents. Most strongly developed in relation to domestic violence, which is arguably the least amenable to this approach. I understand domestic violence as quintessentially a course of conduct. 
and most definitions of it en emphasize that it's a combination, physical, sexual, psychological, financial, spiritual, you know the lists. Measuring it in terms of incidence of crime totally fails to capture that reality. A reality that Evan Stark calls a pattern of coercive control. A pattern of coercive control in which women's everyday life is micromanaged. And it's that that means they become entrapped. It's that that means that they are a group who need and seek support and protection. Very few surveys, even if they're cast in terms of health or women's safety, ask about the everyday intrusions into women's personal space, into the ways that we are being with ourselves is intruded upon. They continue to be trivialized and minimized. And it's this normalization of certain kinds of violence against women that's been a very strong theme in the theorization of violence in many of the Nordic countries. And this was also raised in the Gendered Violence and Violations Conference in relation to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women, that there is a way in which certain forms of violence are normalized, they're taken for granted, we don't question them. So we're not counting all of the violence, and even when we do count it, we're counting it in a way that disconnects it from how it's lived in everyday lives. We can count it a bit better. We can not just have incidents, we can look at frequency, we can look at injury, we can look at fear. But the questions that we ask don't really get to violence as it's lived. Violence in the way that women described it to me when I was doing um, those interviews. We're interested in things, we're t most interested in things that constitute crime. And as one of the interviewees in the book said, um, bruises heal, but a broken spirit is another thing. So I still want to ask this question, who decides what counts? Who decides what's serious enough to be worthy of measurement? I worry that we're moving um, to um, a, a call for harmonized, multi-country international studies based primarily in experiences in the global north. And that this is limiting our ability to even find out what the continuum might look like in the lives of women who are not us, who live in places that are not here. In the Asia Pacific region, for example, I know that there are a number of harmful marriage practices, including polygyny, accusations of witchcraft and sorcery that are um, somehow resolved through sexual relations between um, a woman and a, a healer of some kind. Our current prevalence methods cannot touch those realities in women's lives. We can't find out what they mean to the women and whether they experience them as abusive. Or violent and this has consequences it has major consequences because we take these numbers as telling us a baseline of what matters and what's happening in women's lives and we organize our services around those numbers around those issues if we're not asking about other forms we're not going to provide any support um, and they'll continue to remain hidden. So, just as there's a tension between the concept and measurement, there is also with the constructs of law and crime. Law too, like strict demarcations between what is and is not permissible. And in the case of criminal law, therefore what constitutes a crime? Law with respect to violence throughout Europe and here in Australia is built through gradations of seriousness framed in terms of behavior, sometimes injury, 
applied, again, to discrete incidents. These fundamental building blocks of law sit, sit very uneasily with the concept of the continuum. And they sit uneasily with the wider concepts of harm that human rights discourse is actually now exploring. That said, there are some legal reforms which are more attuned to the idea of the continuum. The most obvious being course of conduct offences that we've introduced in relation to stalking and harassment. Here we recognise that it's an accumulation of intrusions, some of which in and of themselves may appear innocuous and certainly can't constitute a crime. Sending someone a red rose is normatively viewed as an act of affection. It only becomes an act infused by malice when its meaning can be discerned through prior threats or unwanted interactions. Sweden's gone a step further. They have an offence called the gross violation of women's or children's integrity. They're intended to reflect the realities of both domestic violence and child se ongoing child sexual abuse. It's the repetition, the compounding nature of the experiences linked to human rights concepts of harm and physical integrity. And it, they explicitly recognize that when violence is ongoing, it progressively erodes the agency and the fundamental freedoms of the woman and child who is t the target. You can make a charge separately or alongside more traditional offences. The framing of that law, I think, echoes Evan Stark's argument that we need to focus not just on safety, but also on women's freedom. Empowerment means expanding the space for action that violence constrains. You saw those women talking about nothing happening but them constraining their own agency, their own behavior. How much more do we do this if we're living with someone who is constantly demeaning us, constantly putting us down? There are some interesting potentials for the continuum. Um, some women have already extended it and used it in exciting and wonderful ways. Um, Cyril O'Roy, for example, has opened it up to include structural and symbolic violence. Um, and I want to talk to you a little bit about two women who've done their PhDs with us in Kwasu and how they've worked with the concept. Um, Fiona Vera Gray, who used to live in Australia, but we are now very lucky to have her in London, um, studied street harassment, but what she now calls men's intrusions in public space. And many of her participants connected those intrusions to their prior experiences of child sexual assault, of rape or domestic violence. They saw the continuum in their own lives, in their own experiences. And Ava Kanyeredzi um, was exploring black women's experiences of violence. For them, the continuum included their experiences of racist abuse and harassment. Their continuum was one in which there was sexual violence and racialized violence. And several of those women discuss stories which they knew about violence suffered by their mothers and their grandmothers. Ava theorizes this not as a cycle of abuse or intergenerational transmission, but what she calls a historical continuum of oppression. I think a concept that may have relevance for other colonized peoples. And there are potentials for linking the continuum concept with intersectionality in other ways. I want to end thinking about how violence against women intersects with gender inequality, as this was underpinning the analysis in surviving sexual violence. The UN has provided us with an insightful phrase, and lots of us use it, that violence against women is a cause and a consequence of women's inequality. It limits our space for action in public space, in workplaces, in families, as all of us 
have to devote time and energy to what I call safety work. We anticipate the potential of violence. We think about our own safety and we make decisions accordingly. I also talk about the violence work that many victim survivors have to do just to get by each day, let alone rebuild their lives. They carry a burden of work because of something that was done to them, a burden that many of them resent because they, their, their senses that the perpetrator um, carries no burden at all. And far too many survivors have trajectories into drug misuse, criminality, mental health problems, and suicide. That's one side of the story. This, the other side that we don't tell so much, and this is about a continuum of consequences, are the stories of um, the many women among us, the warrior women who take this issue and work with it all of their lives, who do that because of their own, uh, own experiences. And it's become um, almost unsayable to actually um, acknowledge how many of us are actually survivors. Two of our key feminist theorists in the UK, Sylvia Walby and B. Campbell, note that efforts to create gender equality may have stalled across Europe and may potentially be reversed by aspects of globalization, um, neoliberal policies, and more recently, austerity measures. The barriers to progress are many. Um, and, sorry, I've lost my place. Um, but include, according to Sylvia and B, a failure to locate violence as one of the core pillars of gender regimes, gender orders. They also, their work and the work of others show us that there's no simple link between women having more financial autonomy and resources and decreasing violence. The reverse seems to be the case in the short term. In the Nordic countries, for example, they're consistently rated at the top of every conventional measure of gender equality. Equal pay, number of women in paid employment, political representation. Yet the levels of violence against women are as high, and on some measures higher, than in countries with less progress. Similarly, development programs are increasingly aware that challenging economic resources through women whilst effective in promoting income generation, often has the unintended consequence of heightening tension and violence in interpersonal relationships. These um, examples raise a troubling issue, that it might be, as we move towards more gender equality, that more violence happens, at least in the short and medium term, as a proportion of men, not all of them, resist this change. We need to theorize our interventions, not as just about violence, but also as engagements with gender relations and gender regimes. We are trying to change gender relations. We're trying to change the way um, gender hierarchy is reproduced by intervening against violence. And if we took seriously that we're, this is not just about violence, it's about the gender order, maybe we wouldn't um, anticipate um, some of the potential unintended consequences. Violence and abuse are attempts to reproduce gender as a hierarchy between individual men and women, within households, within communities. I'm suggesting that all our interventions are actually challenges to the current gender order. I think women and girls understand this. It sits underneath their resistance to pick up certain options that might look like they're sensible in an abstract sense, but actually in terms of their everyday lives, where they need to continue to live, they raise more complex issues. 
For them, it's never just about violence. It's about power relations, power relations that infuse their lives and their communities. At a theoretical level, I think we know this, but I think it gets lost when practice starts to focus on concepts like risk, safety, and trauma. I want to end on a positive note. This is a study from 70 countries over four decades, and it concluded that it's strong autonomous feminist movements that have challenged social norms on male dominance in the family, sexuality, and more broadly, changed international norms on violence against women, produced enduring impacts at national and policy levels, and this is the most important thing, through a focus on everyday politics. So I want to encourage us all to go back and, and to root ourselves in the everyday politics and the everyday lives of women and their children. Thank you.